everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Josh. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Well, for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Okay. So I am Josh Garbrick. I am in Buffalo, New York, sunny Buffalo, New York. Um, it's warm this time of year, I hear. It is. It's actually almost 70 out right now, which wow. is... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. People. So I was joking, and yet but... you're 25, 30 degrees warmer than I am here in Utah. Right? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's it's good times. It's actually um, it's been a nice ease into what will probably be uh, an Ugly. interesting back right. half of the winter. So yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. You yep. know. Um, I'm a cloud solution architect for Cognizant under the Microsoft Business Group, and uh, it's a recently formed business group that is the result of a couple of different companies coming together, uh, primarily 10th Magnitude, which is where I was uh, originally seated, and uh, New Signature as well. Uh, so those two companies, along with, I think, there were a couple of others that came into the mix later on, but um, we focus on all things Microsoft. So uh, my, cool. my particular area is uh, app modernization and DevOps. Huh. So I do a lot of work with um, not only the solutioning aspects of things, but I get very heavily involved in the delivery aspect as well. I'm always interested to, to talk to folks in the DevOps space in the Microsoft ecosystem because I, like, so I spent a few years, uh, you know, years ago, and folks that have watched this, sorry, broken record on this, but uh, so I, I did, had a startup that I sold the rational software um, ah. a long time ago, pre IBM acquisition, and so I wrote my first three books were on. Clear case, clear quest, and IBM related now IBM related uh, technology, but in the software configuration management space, which is kind of like the DevOps space. So it's managing code, and yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. an interesting space, and uh, it's what's interesting is that when after they Rational sold, there's a bunch of big name people at uh, at Rational that left, and some of them went to Microsoft, uh, and back in like what was that 2001 2002 2003 mm -hmm. time frame somewhere around there so yeah it was uh i think they've all left since then but it was just interesting to see that shift of mindshare go over to, to microsoft in kind of the early days of and that's before of course yeah. we were we refer to it as you know scm not devops um but it's, so it's really kind of expanded with the tool set around that yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, too, to also see some of the trends now where folks are kind of migrating away from Microsoft and going to Google, for example. Like if you, you see like Jeffrey Snover made that move, I know a few other folks have as well. And it's it's just good. I'm glad to see that folks are still staying in the in the overall ecosystem, the technology ecosystem. Um, you know, brand loyalties aside, I think it's still important to be able to have good folks in those positions. So, well, that's it. That is important because we've seen the same with there's a bunch of share former SharePoint people that are over at Google, mm -hmm. and, and Google made it easy by buying a bunch of build like a whole campus right by the East Campus there in Redmond. So it just it's literally down. Was it one fifty fourth down towards mm -hmm. the movie theaters and stuff? Before the Wells so, yeah. Fargo, it's like there's that campus. There used to be like a WeWork there and a bunch of other businesses, and they bought out the whole campus. But yeah, that makes it an easy transition for folks. But you're right. Mm -hmm. it, it, in this day and age, there are very few customers that are solely down one technology stack. There are multiple technologies and players and competing solutions that are in place. And it also speaks to the need for interoperability and movement mm -hmm. in between these different assets. In yeah. the DevOps space, I mean, there is, is there any clear like winners, owners of the space in DevOps, or is it really just spread out? I see. So a lot of the stuff that I've come across, especially over the past several years, um, being in, involved in it from not only the MVP aspect, but also just from a, a general work perspective, you know, obviously you've got, you know, Azure DevOps, um, there's GitHub is obviously a huge, huge, huge. presence and, yeah. and even more so since the acquisition, right? I mean, that's that's definitely picked up steam and, you know, a lot of the enterprise offerings as well, folks are, are starting to, to gravitate towards that. Um, and I've been involved in a couple of migrations off of old on-prem systems 
uh, into GitHub as well. So it, it's definitely interesting there. Uh, I'm still seeing a lot of clamor around GitLab hmm. and people are still clinging to Jenkins for dear life. Um, you know, it's, it's less about what's pretty and more about what's functional for your team, right? I mean, I have my own opinions, but folks also have theirs. And, you know, if it fits your need and it's, it's doing what you need it to do, and it's providing value and helping to, to, you know, demonstrate efficiencies, you know, it's, it's a toss up at that point. I think whatever you pick, as long as it works for you. Yeah, that's because uh, for, for years I was in more in the project management side of things. And so I would work with engineering organizations and build PMOs and, and you know, like that side of things. That's how I kind of got into SCM space. But um, it, you know, it, it, but it's much the same. It's like, you know, use what works for you and with your organization. And if through acquisitions there is a larger number of your you know, users that are on a system, an opposing system, then it might be a hey, time to reflect and go look at what makes sense for the broader organization and, and move things around. I know a lot of, uh, I mean, there, there is a lot of, uh, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's a commoditized space, but it kind of is. There's just mainstream capabilities. I mean, are there really massive differences between the solutions that are out there? And no, yeah, they- No, not really. They, yeah. <laughs> Which is, which is good for practitioners where it's like you can right. take, if you've got depth of knowledge and understanding of one platform, join a new company that's using a competing platform, you're going to get 80, 90% of that right away and just get back up to speed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, all the, the mechanics and the overall UI and usability is fairly transferable between them all. When you get into the, the, the guts, the underlying stuff, like if you're doing a conversion, a platform conversion, there are nuances that will show up that are just like, oh, why did they do that? Or this this is actually pretty cool. I like the way that this is put together versus where we're going. So uh, yeah. it's interesting to get behind the scenes. It's There's always things. It's like every time I go up, my wife is a Mac user and go upstairs and she's like, oh, show me on this. I'm just like, like where are the buttons? Where the, Everything's on the reverse <laughs> side. They intentionally have things swapped out. So those little nuances and things. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a Mac user. I've been a Mac user for quite some time, uh, but I still have like if if I wasn't embarrassed of how cluttered my desk was, I'd show you. Uh, but I've got like the Windows Dev Kit, the new one that just came out. I just bought that. I've got that running. I've got a Nuke Box running. I've got uh, a Raspberry Pi three node cluster that's running Kubernetes. <clears throat> I have another client laptop to to the one side of me. Uh, that's just a, a regular old, you know, Lenovo banger, and uh, my my MacBook. That's my primary from from work. So I'm kind of surrounded on all sides by different processors and electromagnetic fields. So, well, I ha always like to say that while I'm, uh, you know, like my my father in the '80s was like bought one of the first, the uh, like the first you know, Macintosh and, you know, so mm -hmm. like uh, used it for years and years and it was in graphic design in the late eighties, early nineties. And, and so heavily used that, but, and then I've been a PC user ever since, but I have to say that my primary home system for a couple of years was a Mac when Vista mm -hmm. was released because Vista worked perfectly on the Mac. Nice. So it's like, nice. I don't know what the, some, somehow, you know, uh, uh, Apple did the hardware right that whatever, every, every other problem other people had, I never experienced. It just ran beautifully on that Mac hardware. Um, nice. And we used that third party tool to be able to load it and, you know, run it, but it just was fantastic and performant and just, it was a great solution, but anywho, well, so Josh, so you've been an MVP for eight, nine years now. What? Mm -hmm. What was your path to becoming an MVP? So this, I love telling this story, um, mainly because just the randomness of how it all started is, is something that I find funny. Um, long time ago, it was, I think it was like the beginning of 2014 or maybe the end of 2013, somewhere in that time frame. I had started, that's when I started to really get into a lot of the CICD systems and was trying to actively promote that type of thing at, at my place of employment at the time, I started to really get excited about it. And, and it was kind of like when I first taught myself how to actually program, like using VB, you know, I was a VB4 kid. 
that's when I came in was, was around that time. And then once we started to get into things like, you know, C sharp, I, I made that cut over and haven't looked back, but I started to get into the, the CACD platforms and TFS was obviously a big thing around that time. So I started to go through the, it was the Microsoft virtual Academy at the time, I believe was right. what was yeah. out there. Uh -huh. And there were videos out there of, you know, administering TFS and doing all these things. And my goal was to go for a certification. Well, the, the two gentlemen who were doing the courses were of course, Steve Borg, Anthony Borden, right? So I'm watching these courses. I, I really enjoyed the content. I really enjoyed their candor back and forth and their delivery style and all that stuff. So I'm doing a little bit of, of, of side research and I see that there's this group that's called the Visual Studio ALM Rangers. Mm -hmm. And it's a group that's partially Microsoft FTE, partially external folks. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. That would be really fun to be a part of. So as I'm looking through, I look at the membership roster, like who's who's in there. And I see that that Steve is in there. So I'm like on a whim, I email him. And I said, hey, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for the, for the content that you guys have out there for the TFS administration stuff. It's been really helpful for me. It's really gotten me excited about, you know, CICD in general and just the whole, the whole DevOps uh, frame of mind. And, you know, I see that you're also a member of the ALM Rangers, uh, you know, do you have any further information about what, what's entailed with that, how, how you can, you know, express interest or whatever, and he emails me back, he's like, oh yeah, hey, thanks a bunch for, for the kind words on the course, and here's uh, Willie Peter Schaub, who is the program manager for the ALM Rangers, and through a bunch of back and forth, Steve basically chipped in for me and was just like, yeah, he'd be great for the program. And at the time he didn't know me from just about anybody, mm -hmm. uh, but my enthusiasm apparently is, is what kind of initiated that whole thing where um, he was just like, yeah, you know, he, he should be able to join up. No problem. So that's how I started off was on that track with the ALM Rangers. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that got me into the MVP program was working on the very first iteration, the alpha of what's now the, the Azure pipeline system. So if you remember back when where everything was XAML, right? Mm -hmm. And they were just starting to make that cut over into task-based pipelines. Um, myself and I think there were maybe eight or nine other people were directly involved with like Chris Patterson and a bunch of other folks on the on that side of things to test out. I mean, we We beat the crap out of just about every scenario that we could think of. And that's how it started. Like from there, Willie nominated me and, you know, the, the rest is as, you know, history, at least on the internet. So that's, well, that's kind of where I started off to and just kept going. I love asking that question just because, I mean, there, there, are, obviously there are similar patterns when I, you know, so you, like almost 200 MVPs I've interviewed and asked the same question about that. And there are certainly patterns within that. But one of the things, that I'd love to point out is that you, that you reached out to people mm -hmm. like within this, the, the ecosystem, like you get involved, participate, comment, that kind of stuff. So they're like, Oh, Hey, yeah, I recognize, I know you from participating in things. So you can't just come out of nowhere, not having participated and reach out to people that having participated, then you reach out, connect with people, MVPs, Microsoft mm -hmm. people, community leaders that are out there. That's how you start the process that's how you get the ball yeah. rolling it's uh I, it, like i was just telling somebody this week uh, as we're getting ready to organize our what used to be our sharepoint saturday event happening in february which we're now collab days utah and mm -hmm. uh, and, and we had a couple of new faces show up to a planning call and, and just say that hey just just get anybody want to get involved and so people are like hey uh, i i'd like to help out it's like there's no shortage of things to help out with you know, as, as an organizer, we're going to find something for you to go and do and, and get involved. And in. mm -hmm. so we want to see, so if I've got somebody that shows up, they start helping out, they're helping out the user group, they're helping out with training materials, maybe being a, a guest showing what they're doing with their work uh, around certain solutions, that kind of, you know, easy to get involved doing what you're just doing in your normal job. That's how you get that recognition so that if you are interested in going down that path, you can have that conversation. That's right. 
It's absolutely right. And that's, that's critical is just showing up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making people aware that you're interested that, and you want to help and, you know, pitching in where you can. It's less about building, you know, like stacking experience as it is just being there for the experience and, and helping out any way you can. How do you balance? I mean, how do you, Josh, balance that like tooting your own horn versus just surfacing the information like out there? Because that's a real problem for so many people. It's I had managers for a couple different companies that I worked for for years that were like, you're doing great stuff. Nobody sees it. They're like, well, I'm just mm -hmm. doing my job, you know, and I'm trying to right. do it well. But, you know, I'm not trying to go promote the fact that I'm doing my job. So how do mm -hmm. you balance that? How do, how do you kind of get the word out? So a lot of what I do is I, I attack it from two different angles. One is for a lot of the like news updates and things like that, I use Buffer mm -hmm. to help with managing the, the release of that type of stuff. Um, we don't just dress alike. We, we yeah. also, or where is it? There we go. Um, yeah. I, I'm also a Buffer user. So yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I've been I've been I've been a subscriber for a few years now. And it just makes it so much easier to take feeds and you know parse them up and say, hey, you know, I want to make sure that I target this time, this day. You know, if it's over the weekend, maybe I'll get a little bit more aggressive with sending out some updates. Um, the the tooting your own horn and, and self-promotion stuff, I tend to do that, <clears throat> excuse me, a little less liberally um, for a couple of reasons. One, I have a really hard time going, Hey, attaboy, you know, just giving myself the most the, people do though. I, yeah, most yeah. Normal people. I should say normal people have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll pick and choose my battles there. Like for example, when I got it, when I was accepted to do a couple of ask the expert sessions at, at Ignite this year, I put that out there because to me, you know, that's a big deal for me. Yeah. And I like to share that with other folks as well, who, if they're in the neighborhood and they happen to go to the conference and they want to stop by, say hi, you know, chat about something that makes that, that in-person connection a little bit more meaningful. Um, same with books. And I, I'm sure, you know, you're in the same boat where you have things that are getting ready for publication, whether it's books or whether it's, you know, online courses or anything like that, you want to get the word out for, mm -hmm. you know, obviously sales purposes, but also to kind of let folks know, Hey, you know, I, I've spent a considerable amount of time on this particular subject. Um, go check it out. Maybe, you know, hopefully you can find some use of it. Yeah. Uh, agreed. It's uh, I mean, it, it, look, there's a lot of strategies. I, I have provide a lot of advice on there are things that I, that I do that have just become habits now where I like one, one of the things, uh, you know, if you visit my blog, there's actually monthly updates and it, it's, it looks like a, Hey, he's tooting his own horn kind of thing. It's like, no, it was, I started doing it internally just to capture, to make sure that I didn't lose, like, what did I work on? Where did I speak? Where are my slides? Where are the recordings? You know, all mm -hmm. of those things in one place. Then it became a newsletter that I would push out internally to say, hey, here's everything that I've been doing. And I was the chief evangelist for an ISV. And so, like, here's ah, everything okay. that's going on. Then I started tagging everything in, in CRM, anything that was relevant so that if, which I think mm. is a great internal strategy. So that if somebody else in your company and on the sales side is working with the customer, they goes like, what content do we have around this? Oh, Hey, our chief evangelist or our head of engineering or whoever it is, it's the MVP, you know, wrote this blog post on that topic so that there, it helps surface that information. And then over yeah. the years, I, I probably six, seven years ago, I turned it into these monthly just a blog post outlining everything and so i'll often forget i'll it's almost like a time capsule i'll go back and what was i talking about two years ago mm -hmm. i see the outline of exactly what i was talking about that's awesome yeah it's just that's, an extension that, of the brain you know yeah yeah like that that's an aspirational place for me um i'm i'm much less I won't say much less organized, but I won't say I've, I haven't compartmentalized to that level as of yet. So, but that's, that's an absolutely great technique. It's a, it's a process to get there. It doesn't happen just overnight, but yeah, <laughs> like, like anything now, it's just, it's a habit. I just think that way. And you know, what one, one note has all the notes around that and collect it all up. And then it's just in, you know, to organize mm -hmm. it. So, 
Nice. Oh, very cool. Well, what what else? Anything else that's going on in the community? And what what's your involvement there? So I've done a, a few talks uh, virtually for the Microsoft Reactor out in New York. Mm -hmm. So I did a couple of talks on cost management and on dev containers. Uh, I want to say a couple months ago, and then I also did one for an, an Azure group out of Toronto that was covering uh, introduction to Service Mesh. So hmm. I went, you know, kind of ran through the basics of of what it is, why you might want it, why you might not need it, um, what some of the major players are, and key benefits and stuff like that. Um, the sessions at Ignite were actually around cloud for healthcare and cloud for retail. So it was it was more of like an onsite. I don't know if if you were there in person as well. No, I wasn't. It was in um, another event that had already been scheduled, so that got overlapped, uh, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Microsoft. So was, yeah, yeah, exactly. It was an interesting experience. Um, basically, the way that they had the expo laid out, there were different colored zones, and each zone mm -hmm. had this huge U-shaped desk. Um, so I kind of felt like I was working at a Best Buy um, in that respect. <laughs> you know, it's just like I'm chilling back there, and people yeah. come up and ask me questions and stuff. But um, it was fun. It, it, it's a good way to kind of get more randomized feedback from folks right mm -hmm. as opposed to you know typically when you're doing a talk or anything like even if you're doing like a moderated q a or table topic there's still a lot of structure to it whereas you know these you could get any kind of question yeah from things that are you know very very technically deep to just absolutely off the wall stuff like why would you ask me that question <laughs> i love the amas for that purpose too and, and, and you know and if i were more organized i would kind of start i would catalog all the questions whether they're answered or not and again look for the kind of the patterns and say where and that that would for me as a content creator if i keep seeing mm -hmm. questions around there that means that hey they're not getting the answers out of the right you know, the, the, the documentation, I, cause one of the problems is for, for folks that, you know, are not content creators around the tech spaces, you know, Microsoft does is they've really improved their content creation, but so much of it is like, here's how I walk through the steps of to, to get through, navigate through the platform to do something, but then they missed all of the nuances of your industry of your business. They don't have necessarily the case studies, the scenarios, the real world, you know, examples mm -hmm. of that thing, which is really what, you know, people need to, it's, it's like doing a demo against your own data versus the generic data that's out there. Um, I know yep. we all appreciate the Contoso examples that are out there, but you know, when, when you have something that is uh, uh, shared against your industry and with the nuances, the language of the real world and not just the product team trying to translate and walk you through the steps. It makes a big difference. That's why community mm -hmm. content is so invaluable. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, two things come to mind immediately are both within kind of that, that regulated industry area, you know, healthcare and finance, right? So a lot of these examples are really good at getting the core concepts down, but then, you know, a lot of folks that I talked to are like, well, how do I, how do I make this PCI compliant? Or how, how am I, how am I, you know, using something that's going to be able to encrypt everything end to end in, in at rest in motion and in process. Right. I mean, yeah, now there are things for that, but that, that was always a huge nut to crack is to figure out how to do stuff like that. So having even those nuanced, references into how you could potentially leverage other products to do things like that with that yep. industry flair would is something that's really important right well it, and we were as we were talking about earlier the, the the competitive solutions that are out there so there's a lot of questions about how do i move from this other here or how do i get the mm -hmm. two to work together to interoperate how do i you know the, all those kinds of questions that's again that's why i love the amas it's always great when there's a panel of you versus just you there so there's a lot of, I, I don't know answers, but a uh, great thing about an MVP is that we might know, not know the answer, but we probably know somebody who does know the answer. Exactly. Um, but I prefer having the panel. So you, a group mm -hmm. of us answering those questions, but well, Josh, well, really appreciate your, your time today for uh, folks that want to uh, follow you or reach out and connect with you. What are the best ways to reach you? I would say Twitter and LinkedIn. So my Twitter handle is at Jay Garverick. 
and my LinkedIn profile is out there in the wild. Uh, it's just linkedin.com in Josh Dash Garbrook. Easy. And we'll have the links, of course, in the blog post out on buckleyplanet.com. And for those that are uh, listening to the podcast and uh, also out on YouTube. So, Josh, really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks. Been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Enjoy the the, the coming winter. I don't know that what was the Game of Thrones. He was like, the winter is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's and it's funny because my chair is actually uh, a Game of Thrones custom from Secret Lab that oh. has a winters coming on the side of it. So it's, nice. it's interesting you bring that up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you're in Buffalo. It's coming. It's going to hit hard. So yes, stay Always. safe. Yeah, indeed. Wow.